The first and most important concept in experimental dynamics is the understanding of data acquisition systems and vibration sensors. And really, the idea of experimental dynamics is bringing our observations of the real world and laboratory settings into analytical domains and computational frameworks. So then we could do some really cool engineering. So what are vibration sensors? These are sensors that are able to record kinetic energies of physical systems, ideally without disturbing the natural dynamics of those systems. Examples include accelerometers, strain gauges, displacement transducers, and load cells. A vibration sensor can be thought of as a mass spring type oscillator. These are devices that have their own dynamics. In the case of a device shown here on the right, uh, we are looking to infer the motion of the base from the motion of the sensor mass. So the motion U is inferred from the motion Y. And to do this, we must have a pretty good knowledge of the sensor dynamics. Now, I want you to look at this uh, equation of motion for the sensor oscillator shown here on the left. And I'm going to convert this equation of motion into a frequency response function. If you're not familiar with the concept of FRFs or frequency response functions, that's completely okay. We're gonna have a lecture completely dedicated to frequency domain and frequency response functions. Now, we are showing the frequency response functions between input displacement U to output displacement Y for a displacement sensor and input acceleration u dot dot and output displacement y for an acceleration sensor. And really the only usable parts of the frequency response function are the flat parts that are shown here in the red. In the case of the displacement sensor, we have good measurements at lower frequencies where the flat part is. And in the case of the acceleration sensor, we have good measurements at higher frequencies. And pretty much the other frequency bandwidths are exposed to the resonant uh, components of the sensor where we're getting a lot of peaks and uh, we're getting attenuations at all, all the other frequencies and we don't want to use those. Now in the sensor slash data acquisition world, whenever you acquire a new sensor device, these devices come with data sheets that have many specifications. Some of the common specifications include sensitivity, resolution, and operational frequency range. Sensitivity is a calibration factor between the measured output voltage and the input vibration. And those uh, vibrations could be accelerations, velocities, or displacements, pretty much anything. Resolution is the smallest change that a sensor can measure. And lastly, frequency range is the range over which the sensitivity of the transducer does not vary more than a stated percentage. Outside of that range, environmental factors such as temperature can change the sensitivity of the sensor a lot. So we start off with accelerometers. The question is, how do accelerometers work? There are generally two types of accelerometers that we deal with, capacitive and piezoelectric. Capacitive accelerometers work on the basis of the concept of capacitance, which uh, is pretty much the ability of a material to hold electrical charge for a given voltage. And uh, we generally have some kind of a proof mass in these kinds of accelerometers with two uh, surfaces uh, that have capacitance properties. Between these two surfaces, there is generally a ceramic through which DC electricity cannot flow. And this material is generally called a dielectric. Now, the capacitance of these surfaces are proportional to the distance between these two surfaces uh, that's referred to here as Z. So when Z uh, changes, the capacitance of these surfaces change, the amount of electrons they're able to hold changes, and those electrons we can measure through data acquisition systems. And that's really how capacitive accelerometers work. Piezoelectric accelerometers on the hand are, work on the basis of uh, having piezoelectric crystals. These are crystals and uh, whenever they're compressed or elongated, uh, the mechanical energy is converted to electricity and we're able to measure voltage. The difference between these two accelerometers is that uh, capacitive accelerometers can measure static acceleration 
And a very good example of static acceleration is the gravitational pull of the Earth, whereas piezoelectric accelerometers can't. That's really the main difference between the two. Another commonly used sensor device is a strain gauge, which is usually used to measure compression and elongations. And strain gauges are essentially long wires that are stretched and their resistance changes. Resistance of a material is a function of its resistivity, which is really a material property, a function of area and length. So whenever you elongate a wire, you're changing its length and you're also changing its area. Its area is getting smaller due to its Poisson ratio. And because of that, the resistance changes. Now, this change in resistance is often quite small. So what we do is, is we create this uh, device called the Wheatstone Bridge, which is comprised of multiple resistors and a strain gauge shown here in R2. And of course, we can't measure resistance as a property. We can only measure voltage via data acquisition systems. So we create this configuration where we supply some kind of uh, input voltage and we're able to find what the output voltage is between these two nodes. And this relationship is shown down here. Whenever there are no elongations, we generally speaking have a balanced bridge and uh, we're not getting any voltage measurements. Whenever we are getting voltage measurements, it means that our strain gauge is undergoing elongation or compression. And then we could use uh, the calibration factors to correlate voltage to uh, strain. Load cells are another class of vibration sensors used to measure forces. There are two main types of load cells. Uh, one is strain gauge load cells and the other is piezoelectric load cells. The scales that we have at homes or at gyms are generally uh, made from strain gauge type load cells and we use those to measure our weights. And the physics of these devices are really simple. Strain is directly proportional to force in strain gauge type load cells and voltage is directly proportional to force in piezoelectric load cells. So if you know the calibration factors, you multiply it by the voltage and you're able to find what the forces are. Displacement transducers are another class of vibration measurement devices. Uh, these include cable and linear variable differential, di differential uh, type transducers. And uh, really the physics of these devices involve having magnetic coils uh, where displacement results in changes in the magnetic field of these coils and which uh, result in changes in the voltage that we can measure again via data acquisition systems. So we could relate the voltage that's measured or the changes in the voltages that are measured with changes in displacements. Now, when it comes to signal measurement and data acquisition, we're always uploading continuous time signals, which are real world signals to discrete time signals, which is how digital computers think and manage signals. And this process involves obtaining an analog signal from a sensor. We time sample that signal, which means we discretize it on the horizontal axis or the time axis. And then quantization, which is discretization along the vertical axis or the amplitude. And we can have different sampling rates and we can have different quantization levels. For instance, uh, we always want to have a fairly good resolution with our amplitudes. So we don't want to go with very uh, low level quantization devices or analog to digital converters. At the same time, we don't want to go with really high-end, expensive uh, ADC devices uh, because, first of all, they're going to measure a lot of noise, uh, which we don't want, and secondly, that the cost is uh, tend to cost tend to add up fairly quickly. Now, when performing sampling, it's important to select sampling rates that are pretty much uh, make sense. They have uh, good rates relative to the frequencies that we're dealing with in our signals. We must, for example, be aware of the concept of Nyquist sampling, where the sampling frequency needs to be at least twice the highest frequency contained in the signal. And I'll explain in a second what that means. Now, imagine here in this top plot, we have a, 
signal uh, that's harmonic, uh, the frequency is 7 kilohertz. And we try to uh, discretize and sample this uh, signal with a 10 kilohertz uh, sampling. And the positions of the sampled signals are indicated with the blue circles. What the computer gets out of the analog to digital converter is a signal that looks entirely different. It has a different uh, frequency bandwidth, and this is not ideal. In fact, we could have uh, another kind of signal with a frequency of 13 kilohertz that can fit the same model. And again, that's not ideal. And this pretty much stems from the fact that the discretization or the sampling frequency that we used was not fast enough, and we ended up getting signals that look entirely different, and this can be bad in practical situations. So really, the idea of Nyquist sampling is to have a frequency rate that is twice the frequency that's contained in our signal. This is Fs greater than or equal to 2Fc, Fc being the highest frequency we expect from our signal. And uh, another issue we need to understand is the concept of spectral leakage. It stems from the violation of the assumption of the discrete fast Fourier transform algorithm, which assumes that signals are perfectly periodic within a sampled period. So here we have a 10 hertz signal uh, within a sampled period of one seconds. That means that I have 10 perfect cycles within one second. And when I do discrete fast Fourier transform of this time domain signal, I get a frequency domain signal that looks perfect. I have a unity amplitude at exactly 10 hertz, and I have no other uh, amplitudes at the other frequencies. And this is what I should expect, theoretically speaking. However, in the practical situation and in real life, we never have perfectly windowed signals and perfect uh, sampling periods. So what I've done is I've said, okay, what if I have a sampling frequency of 10.1 hertz, and um, I have, uh, so this is a signal with 10.1 hertz as the frequency of the sign, and my window is still one second. So the problem is I'm no longer going to have that perfect, perfectly aligned harmonic signal uh, where the beginnings and the ends line up with the uh, sample period. And when I do DFFT or the discrete fast Fourier transform, I get what's re commonly referred to as spectral leakage. And uh, we can see a lot of the energy from the 10 hertz signal or the 10.1 hertz signal has transformed into the higher frequency signals. Now, this problem can usually be solved with uh, the concept of windowing where we take different kinds of uh, windowings, elliptical windows or other kinds of windows and wrap them around this time domain signal and we're able to improve spectral leakage. We could also make sure our signal is perfectly periodic. Uh, we could increase the resolution of our signal, but we can never get rid of spectral leakage. We can always improve it, but we're always going to be dealing with it. So uh, that's something we gotta keep in mind. Having said that, uh, I thank you and I will see you in the next lecture.